I'm Craig Kenneth, a relationship coach and a psychotherapist. Every relationship is different and every breakup is different. Work with me and you'll get professional help on your situation. Just click on the link in the description below or go to my website, AskCraig.net. Hi there, I'm Coach Craig Kenneth. Hi there, I'm Coach Margaret. And today we're going to be talking about how to treat sexual addiction. Yes. So, due to the huge boom of the internet yes. and the easy access of pornography or, yes. or pornographic related materials, people often find themselves in an uncomfortable position. With, no matter which partner you are, you're in a bad position. Right. And so, sometimes it can lead you to a place that's not going to be healthy for you or your relationship. That's right. And it could hurt your partner. Or you might find yourself hurting your partner. Yes. Or living with a lot of guilt and shame. And tension because she's, you promised and then you still did it and she's not happy with you. Uh, absolutely. Or the other way around because women certainly do this as well. So the reason that we wanted to do this video for you today is because if you're in a situation where your partner is having some sexual addiction or possibly yourself, you want to know how to handle it. Right. What Be do you do? It's really confusing and it's really overwhelming. Yes. Because you might find yourself with a partner who is uh, online, looking at porno, or interacting with other people, right. and you're feeling like they're cheating on you. And that person says, there's no problem. Why are you so upset? Exactly. I didn't touch them. I didn't right. physically interact with them. This isn't cheating. And so it could be affecting your relationship. Sure it could. And when that trust is affected, it's going to lead to a lot more problems Absolutely. in the relationship. Yes. So today we're going to look at a lot of the different aspects for treating sexual addiction. Uh, we did another video on sexual addiction that I'm sure you've already seen. If you haven't, go back and review that review one. Review it before you watch this one. Yes. Because the numbers are staggering. Yes, they really are. And so, Margaret, can you explain a little bit about what sexual addiction is? Well, it's like any other addiction. We're used to dealing with alcohol and drug addiction, where the addiction slowly becomes the major high point in a person's life. And sort of forsaking all others, including you, um, the person becomes absorbed in this for larger and larger number of hours per day. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's almost consuming their entire yes, life. Yes, an addiction consumes your entire life. Mm -hmm. And what it, there are a couple of things you look at. How long does it take you to obtain the substance, which is probably hardest for drug abusers, mm -hmm. and it's risky. Um, alcohol is pretty readily available, but the internet is instantly available. Mm -hmm. If you feel bad, if you're depressed, and again, it highly correlates with mood disorders. If you feel depressed or anxious or whatever, you have instant access to the internet that will make you feel much better, much fast, much faster. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. So, the addiction is a symptom of a bigger problem. Yes. And that's what we're trying to help you see is that it's not necessarily what they're doing as opposed to why they're doing it, what's going on with somebody that has an addiction like this. Good for you, Craig, for putting it that clearly. I didn't. <laughs> okay, so what's going on when a person has an addiction like this? Well, if you've listened to us for any length of time, you won't be surprised to hear that it's all about the kind of family you grew up in and the kind of attachment you formed as a little one. Mm -hmm. The Statistics on the amount of child abuse in people who use this pornography is 90% for emotional abuse and 81% for sexual abuse and I think 72% for physical abuse. Wow. So it's child abuse that messes up attachment that leads to addiction. One of the tricks with addiction is that you don't need another person to help you do it. Do whatever the 
the addiction is. And besides, you've already learned when you're really little that other people are unreliable. Mm -hmm. If you're not taken care of by reliable people, if you're not comforted by reliable people, then you end up possibly turning to an addiction to provide you with the comfort and consistency you never got. Okay. That's a lot to swallow for a okay. lot of people. Did it make sense, first of all? Oh, well, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, so what we're trying to get you to understand is that if you did not have a healthy, secure attachment to your caregivers, right. it, your internal state is constantly struggling yes. with massive amounts of anxiety. Or depression. Or both. Or depression. Or yeah. But when people are feeling anxious and depressed, they are looking for something to change the way they, they feel, feel inside. inside. Yes. So, they turn to pornography, drug addiction, alcohol, any kind of addiction. Right. right? And one of the striking things about addiction is that it's solitary. You can drink alone, you can use drugs alone, and you can kind of view porn alone because you're at least not having direct contact. So you're not depending on a possibly unreliable other to soothe you. Absolutely. Okay. So think about that for a second. I think this is a concept that's going to take a little bit to kind of grasp. Right. And it's a profound concept. Yes. And so you really want to think about this, okay? you got to imagine somebody is in an internal state of anxiety, depression, they're fearful. They feel awful. They feel awful, and so they're looking for something to make them feel better. Now, a healthy person with a secure attachment right. would look, to, if you're a child, you would go to your parents That's right. to feel soothed. Yes. Right? You're going to them because they make you feel better. You right. go to your mom and your dad to make yes. you feel better. Now, if you are abused or neglected in any way, you're not going to feel safe going to another person. Right. Because you've learned they're not reliable. So instead, you go to an addiction. You right. go to that other thing like the alcohol that changes your state or the or pornography or the... Um, the drug, the drugs, the drug to change the internal state. That's right. Because you don't feel safe going to right. another person. And, and this is a really yeah. profound, a profound concept. Concept. Right. Because it's not about the symptoms. The symptoms is the addiction. Right. It's really the internal state and the inability to change that or, or cope with that. Or to soothe yourself, which you can't do either if you didn't have a secure attachment. So you're looking to be soothed, or sometimes you feel numb, or you're looking to be excited. And usually the danger of getting caught with addiction can do that for you too. Yes. But it's to change your internal state, Greg. Thank you. You did that very clearly. It's And so you want to understand this. This is what's going on within your partner. And it's not feeling all that great to them, okay? Because no. there's going to be a lot of negative feelings that come with that, right? Right. So, and the other thing to think about is shame. And shame is the feeling of being little and helpless and unlovable. Okay, so it would mm -hmm. bring back those feelings of being helpless and unlovable, which is how you were treated. And again, why would you want to go to anybody who would still probably treat you that way? Mm -hmm. So we can certainly understand how this happens. Now, it would be a big leap to get from that to understanding that the source is child abuse, but fortunately for us, years of research has been done in between. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happens with addictions is that you become more and more isolated. You're no longer interested in anything other than the addiction, mm -hmm. because it isn't, you know, the rest of it isn't doing anything for you. So the first thing you want to do is break the isolation. That's why there's Alcoholics Anonymous, that's why AA works. Um, if you weren't used to going to parents to talk to you, you go to your group and they embrace you almost like a family mm -hmm. and they listen to how you feel. Yeah. Same thing with addiction with drugs. And there are also beginning to be groups for addiction to sex on the internet. Um, I think they're in, a, they're in a beginning stage, but they do exist. I worked somewhere once where they had a chapter of 
Sex Addicts Anonymous, and it was very well attended, I can tell you, and that was almost 20 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Now, the thing that I think it's important for them to also understand is that your person, your partner, whoever it is, or maybe if it's you, is so overwhelmed right. by this feeling yeah. that they will literally do anything, anything to get it. To get the alcohol, to the get drug. the drugs. Yep. to look at the pornography. If you're Even if you're saying, I'm going to watch your phone, I'm going to check the computer, I'm going to check all this, it they're going to they're gonna find a way. It won't make any difference, yes. So if they're not ready to think about change, and that's called the pre-contemplative stage, um, then, yeah, and they'll promise you that they'll give it up, which many people mean at the time they say it. Mm -hmm. But then when they find out that nothing else makes them feel better, um, they're again going to find it. But the best scenario would be one that you actually had, Craig, a couple of weeks ago. The boyfriend said to his girlfriend, I think I'm addicted to this stuff. All right, then you have a place to start. Mm -hmm. How can we find you help? You took the first step by saying it. You owned the behavior and you said, I don't want this, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that would be the ideal response. Yeah. But usually many people are going to do a dance with denial before they get to that point. Yes. And you can't move forward until the other person is saying, I need help with this. I need help with this, yes. And just talking to you is a leap of faith that you're going to accept them. And that's why you would never berate anybody who finally says to you, I think I'm addicted to this. Well, God love you. Now I can begin to help you. Mm -hmm. And that may be the first corrective emotional experience they ever had. You didn't reject them. You listened and you offered help. Mm -hmm. Okay? But you can't continue to try and save somebody ready to say, I need help. I'm going to no, do what I have to can't. do. You can give Please. them a little time to kind of digest that concept. But time after time after time... Um, you know, and chances are you can't do it yourself. That's why there are all these A's mm -hmm. um, with the alcohol, the drugs, and the sex addiction. I can do it myself. Well, some people do, but is it likely? Not really. And again, you have to um, challenge the isolation. Reach out. Find other people, which is the healthy way to soothe yourself. Mm -hmm. Because they're dealing with the trauma. They're dealing with a trauma. And it's very easy to forget that. And many people will respond with, I'm not interested in excuses. Explanations are not excuses. There's a difference. And Let's talk about that. Okay. What's the difference between an explanation and an excuse? Okay. Because there are going to be a lot of people out there that are like, wait, but my boyfriend said this. And was it an excuse? Was it an explanation? There's a big difference. And that was said by one of the earliest people in the child abuse um, field that explanations are not excuses. Say for example you hear about um, some acting out that your parent did. Um, if you know anything about how they grew up, if they were abused, if they had a terrible time, then you're going to have a new understanding of why they did what they did. Would they still have to own the behavior? Yes. So an explanation is just that. Mm -hmm. It gives us a way to understand behavior, but not to excuse it. Mm -hmm. You're still responsible for what you did. You could have gone to a therapist. You could have done something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, now that we understand what's going on with you, everybody feels better, and we can understand where the behavior comes from. Nobody ever said, I want to grow up to be an addict. Nobody ever said, I, wanted to, I want to grow up to make my children addicts. Or, or have problems in the future. Nobody ever said that. So nobody does these things fully on purpose. But as human beings, we have to be responsible for our own behavior. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be grown-ups, we have to be. Absolutely. Okay? So um, I always challenge that. Well, that's just an excuse. No, I expect you to get help and to talk about it and to do whatever you can. Um, but I'm not going to condemn you as a bad person. Can you give some excuses somebody might hear that would say, you know what, this person isn't really serious about getting help. Oh, I can handle this without it getting in the way of our relationship. I've heard that one a lot of times. Mm -hmm. No, you really can't. Um, I have an unusually high sex drive. No, 
that doesn't mm -hmm. lead to addiction. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me feel better and I can't function without it. I believe that because that's the story for addicts. But talking about it is the way out of that, and breaking the isolation is the way out of that. Mm -hmm. The difference between a coping mechanism and a symptom um, is that the symptom always has a downside. The downside being that you're making your partner very upset and feel rejected and be worried about you, and your withdrawal behavior. Mm -hmm. Those are the downsides. Mm -hmm. Can we? Uh, every symptom has a, a plus, so we wouldn't do it. Um, would we argue that it makes you feel better? No. Would we argue that it will be hard for you to give it up? No. Um, but, and it does have the upside for you, but always a symptom has something self-destructive attached to it. Can you give an example? Uh, most of the symptoms you know. Um, if you're an angry person and you have angry outbursts and you end up alone a lot, um, you can figure out that the angry outburst helps you get out terrible feelings that you've been walking away around with, but it's going to drive everyone away from you. Mm -hmm. If you don't know when this person might go off, you know, you're not going to want to spend a whole lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. um, there are, if you think of any symptom that, that you'd ever complain that anybody had, so-and-so is anxious all the time. Um, well, have they consulted a therapist? Have they looked into medication? Have they talked about it? Mm -hmm. um, and talking about it is the first step. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say it again, as a society, we don't give men a lot of encouragement about having feelings, and if they do, God forbid they should talk about them or name them. All right? If you ask men if they're depressed, usually they say, and I'm going to demonstrate, no. <laughs> well, and then it's easy because you can do that back to them and they, they laugh. But it's very difficult for men to admit weakness and it's unfair what we've done to them on that count. Yes. So it, guys, please start talking. It, it, it really is unfair how much it pressure is. there is on men yes. to not display weakness. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, that vulnerability um, really in society has made men feel like they're weak or right. look you know, yeah. like they can't handle things. Right. So we've told men that, yeah, that they're not allowed to have feelings, and that's a really dirty trick. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we meant to do it. But men, you have a full set of emotions, and you have a right to every one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, so I think for, for men, it's even harder to begin to disclose um, and to be vulnerable in the way that, you know, both parties have to be quite vulnerable to have a really intimate relationship, Absolutely. which I think is usually the goal for most relationships. Yeah. Okay. So, if you are in a relationship with somebody who is having problems with an addiction, like a sexual addiction, you know, they need help. Yes, they do. And if they're just giving you promises, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse for them too, because they're going to feel bad every time they can't keep the promise. Mm -hmm. so. And you're just going to lose more trust in them, yep. the relationship's going to deteriorate, and so I would say, unless you are actually seeing and get committed to help or, and, and, and saying, yes, I am committed to getting this help, I don't want to continue doing this, I really do want to make this work, right. you can't magically change them. No, and no, you can't. And you can, you can do the therapeutic things. Remember, therapy is anything that's different from your family of origin. If they were being yelled at, don't yell at them. Okay, if they were being rejected, don't reject them. If they were being shamed, which is probably a lot of the issue, you don't want to make them feel any worse than they already do. Mm -hmm. But you also can't put up with it for a really long time. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you need to seek help, um, on the computer there are numerous um, resources for help with this in a specialized way. I don't know that your average therapist is trained to deal with this. And anytime you seek a therapist for anything you have, ask if the therapist specializes in that or if they know anybody who does. Um, but if I'm an expert in, I don't know, spider phobias, you don't want me for sexual addiction. <laughs> okay? So talk a little with the therapist. Unless you're really into spiders. Unless you're really into spiders. <laughs> Not an addiction I've heard of since Charlotte's Web. But anyway. Um, Talk with the therapist. Nobody's going to condemn you for that, and if they do, hang up on them, okay? 
Um, it's tough enough to do therapy, but you certainly need the right one who knows what they're talking about yeah. when it comes to you. There are people who are licensed in sex therapy and who are trained in treating internet addiction more and more as we have more and more of it. Yeah. Um, so look on the computer first. There are people like us who do online coaching mm -hmm. and can also refer you to various places depending on what you need. Um, so help is available to you. You can always call your local mental health folks. They may have somebody who knows about this, they may not. You can see someone who addresses things more generally at first. Any anonymous program would be able to help you, and most substance abuse counselors would be able to help you. Yeah, and I think that would be the place to go. Right. Um, first and foremost. Yeah. Right. I mean, we could obviously help coach you through trying to figure out where to go and right. how to, you know, work things out with your ex if that's what you're trying to if do. That's what you're trying to do. But you're definitely going to want to see them in therapy yes. with somebody locally that can treat them and help them. And it has to be somebody who knows addiction. And remember, the addiction is the symptom, okay? Not you ahead. You got to realize it's a trauma with the attachment, and so their internal state is the real struggle, their inability to handle that. Their inability to soothe themselves and make themselves feel better because nobody did it for them yeah. when they were little. That's right. And so this has been going on their entire life and they don't know anything different. No. So, the good introduction. I'm sure we'll get into other videos in the future um, when it comes up. We welcome your feedback. But um, hopefully this topic will help many of you guys that are dealing with an right. issue like this. If, of course, you want to get my help personally, just go to my website, AskCraig.net. Sign up for the coaching option that works best for you. I do email coaching. I do Skype coaching. And if you got to get with me right away, I do offer emergency Skype coaching. Margaret will be on the website very soon for doing Skype coaching, if she hasn't by the time this video is up there. Yes. And so... That's it for this video. I'm Coach Craig Kenneth. I'm Coach Margaret. Please get help if you need it. And we will talk with you soon.